Hello, uh, my name is John Dowling. I'm the Sustainability Manager at the British Constructional Steelwork Association. Uh, the BCSA is the representative organisation for the steelwork contractors in the UK and Ireland. For the next 35 to 40 minutes, I'm going to talk to you on the subject of thermal mass in buildings. This presentation is built around uh, a document which we published in 2004 called Thermal Mass. Uh, it can be obtained from an article on www.steelconstruction.info forward slash thermal mass. For those of you who have not used Steel Construction Info before, uh, this is the steel industry encyclopedia, web-based encyclopedia. It is based very much on the Wikipedia, the sort of format you'll find on Wikipedia. So anybody who's familiar with Wikipedia will be immediately um, at ease with steelconstruction.info. So that document can be uh, downloaded from that, that website. There's also uh, the, the article on thermal mass on steelconstruction.info delves into the detailed technical issues around thermal mass a bit more than I'm going to do here today. So if you want to know more, if you want additional information on the detailed technical issues, please go to that article. It's worth, I think, going back in history a little to understand what thermal mass is and where it comes from. By the way, I actually prefer the term fabric energy storage rather than thermal mass. I think it, that it describes the phenomenon better. However, thermal mass is the expression that has come into general use and I'll stick with it during this presentation. I first heard the th term thermal mass in the mid 1990s when the steel construction sector became aware that a number of buildings in Scotland which we might reasonably have expected to have been built in steel, were actually in the process of being constructed in reinforced concrete. When we checked as to why this was happening, we were told that it was because of thermal mass. We looked into this and we found that the concept had been introduced into Scotland at a conference a few years earlier by the then president of the Royal Institute of British Architects, who gave a speech at a conference in, I think it was in Stirling. Now the reason this speech had been given a few years earlier and we were only hearing about it now was because the gestation period of these buildings is usually perhaps two to three years. The theory that was explained in the course of that presentation was that large old buildings and an example of the sort of buildings which were being discussed were is something like the Radcliffe camera in Oxford which you can see a picture of here a very beautiful old building uh, in, uh, in Oxford. The theory was that these buildings never even get warm on never get warm on even the hottest day and that this is because the heavy structures these very heavy monolithic structures soak up excess heat therefore went the theory if one wants to reduce the energy required for cooling in modern buildings one should build structures that are heavy with lots of mass in terms of modern building methods, that really meant constructing your buildings from reinforced concrete. It's a good theory, but unfortunately, part of it was based on a fallacy. The part that was correct was that building structures can soak up heat. The part that was wrong was saying that you have to have large mass in the structure to take advantage of that. In fact, the reason why these types of buildings, buildings like the Radcliffe camera, don't heat up in the same way as modern buildings is because they have small windows and low solar gain. Also, they do not generally contain the large amounts of electrical equipment or have the high occupancies which one finds in modern commercial structures and which are, and which are usually associated with high internal gains. The theory of thermal mass says that as heat is generated in a building, it heats the air and this air then moves against the exposed concrete or stone in the building. And this word expose is important because what it means is that to make thermal mass work, you need to expose an area of concrete or stone in the building, usually concrete. And that is almost always the underside of the floor above you. So it's the, the soffit of the floor above you is the part that's exposed. So this, this heat is generated by the various activities in the building. This heat is then passed from the air to the concrete or the, the, the concrete of the stone. At night, 
the windows of the building are opened and the cool night air removes the heat from the floor. So heat is stored in the structure by day and expelled at night by the flow of cool air across the exposed surfaces. This has two effects. It has the effect of reducing the peak temperature in the building and delaying the time at which the peak temperature occurs. Used properly, thermal mass allows buildings to be constructed without the need for air conditioning, and this reduces the energy use for carbon emissions in buildings. So thermal mass does work when it is utilized properly. And there's an example, there's a very good example here in the next slide. This is the Wessex Water Building um, near Bath, the Wessex Water Headquarters Building near Bath. In its time, this was probably the most energy efficient building in the country. It dates from around 1997 or 1998. And it used the principle of thermal mass, it used the principle of thermal mass to replace a lot of the energy that would normally be required for cooling. What it uses is it uses bespoke thin concrete floor slabs in this kind of a shallow U shape. You can see them there. Uh, on the bottom flange, slotted into the bottom flange of uh, shallow beams, and they sit on the bottom web, or the, like I said, the bottom flange of the shallow beams. Some of the beams then contain perfora perforations to allow the air to be, to the cool night air to flow in and take the excess heat away from that, uh, from those slabs, those floor slabs. The important thing about this is that it is a building in which thermal mass is used. It's a building in which thermal mass has worked. And this is a steel building with a lightweight frame and thin concrete floors. Those concrete floors were probably no more than 120, 130 millimeters thick in total. So why does that happen? Why can you get thermal mass out of a relatively thin floor as well as a, a relatively thick floor? The quantity of mass in a building which can be linked to the internal atmosphere to provide thermal mass is governed by the admittance of the material of the construction. This is usually the floor slab, as I said, and this is usually concrete. So the admittance places a limit on the, on the amount of mass which can be mobilized. The admittance is a measure of the ability of a material to exchange heat with the surroundings. <clears throat> BRE Digest 454 Part 1 defines this as the rate at which a square meter of surface area can absorb heat from the air at a temperature difference of 1 degree centigrade expressed in units of watts per meter square degree K. That's quite a mouthful. I'll just say it again. Admittance is the rate at which a square meter of surface area can absorb heat from the air at a temperature difference of 1 degree centigrade expressed as units of watts per meter square degree K. And what you'll see there is that for concrete, it reaches a maximum at about 100 millimeters thick. A report from the BRE Energy Conservation Support Unit sta states that admittance is dependent upon a number of material variables, notably density, thermal density and thermal capacity, and the thermal conductivity of the first 100 millimeters or so below the surface. So, as I've said, admittance is a function of the depth of the material absorbing the excess heat. And here's the critical part. Going back to BRE Digest 454 Part 1, this states that based on a 24-hour period of, cool, of heating and cooling, temperature variations penetrate up to about 100 millimeters, depending on the material type and the rate of heat transfer. Increasing the amount of thermal mass beyond the 100 millimeter depth on a specific surface offers little benefit for on a, on a diurnal cycle. Diurnal cycle is a cycle of 24 hours, a daily cycle. Summarized, this means that on a 24 hour cycle of heating and cooling, it is possible to utilize only about 100 millimeters of mass to absorb excess heat. And this is why Wessex Water was able to utilize more uh, thermal mass without having a massive thick structure. You could have put a massive thick structure in there, you would not have had any more thermal mass in there. This is something that has been recognized for some time and it has been widely reported in published papers, which has been accepted by both the steel and the concrete construction sectors. So all construction sectors recognize that if you want to utilize thermal mass, you don't need the thick monolithic structures. 
About 10 years ago, eight or 10 years ago, we did a study on this, or the Steel Construction Institute did a study on this with uh, AECOM. And what they looked at was they looked at a fairly standard four-story office building. Now, um, you can see it there in diagrammatic form. Now, it's worth seeing at this point that when we talk about multi-story buildings, uh, if I was to ask the audience for this to uh, mention a multi-story building probably most of us would start to say things like oh the walkie-talkie or the shard or the canary wharf tower or something like that in fact they are exceptions and in a lot of ways they're exceptional the vast majority of the multi-story building stock especially in commercial buildings is actually two three and four story buildings but 80 85 percent by floor area of multi-story non-domestic buildings are two three and four story and in terms of actual numbers it's probably more like about 90 95 percent so what you're looking at here is um, a representation of the sort of bog standard building which forms the bulk the huge bulk of the uk non-domestic building stock Having said that, like I said, there's nothing special about the building. So what AECOM did was they looked at that building as though it had been designed using five different flooring systems. So they looked at a slim deck system. They looked at a composite slab with comp floor 70 deck. They looked at a precast concrete floor system. They looked at a reinforced concrete floor system. And they looked at a hollow core precast floor system. And out of those, I would say that probably the most common are number two and number four. Certainly number two is by far the most common in commercial buildings in particular. And what you can see there on the right hand side, the thing to really note is that the thinnest floor slab was 104 millimeters thick and the thickest floor slab was 30, 300 millimeters thick. As I said, you can get the report on this from um, steelconstruction.info forward slash thermal mass. Um, it's quite a detailed report, quite a lot in there. It's well worth the read if you're really into thermal mass. Um, but I'm just going to take one result from it, just to illustrate it. There looks to be a lot on this slide. Um, please don't be worried about that. What it is, is it is a representation of the number of occupied hours, the number of occupied hours that are exceeded or that are found at each temperature uh, variation. So, for example, if you look at that one there, where I have the cursor, you're looking at between... 20 and 21 degrees centigrade, that building will be between 20 and 21 degrees centigrade for just over 20%, about 21% of the time. It will be between 22 to 23 degrees centigrade between about 24 and 25% of the time. And the reason for saying that um, is to say that when you look at it, there is no difference between those flooring systems. There are small marginal differences, but in real terms, they're, they're probably all well within the boundary of error. Effectively, all the four flooring, the five flooring systems will give you more or less the same thermal mass potential. So you, again, you don't have to go to big thick floors to mobilize thermal mass. I want to move on now to the subject of um, when you will and will you will not use thermal mass because there are times when it's just not right to use thermal mass, and there are times when it is right to use thermal mass. I'm going to give one or two examples of situations where it's not, or it has been shown not to be the right thing to do, and then we'll have a couple of case studies where we can sh show that it is the right thing to do. Some years back, uh, the steel construction sector did uh, a huge body of work that some of you may have heard of called Target Zero. And again, if you go to steelconstruction.info, there is an article on Target Zero in there. And we looked at things like energy efficiency, for example, uh, in over a range of buildings. And one of the buildings that we looked at, and there is a, a detailed report on this building um, on, on the thermal, in the thermal mass article on steelconstruction.info, one of the buildings we looked at was Knowsley School in Greater Manchester. It's actually in Rochdale. So this was subjected to a detailed analysis within within Target Zero. And there was a couple of findings on this with regard to thermal mass. The first thing was the building as built was mechanically ventilated, and this provided the required levels of cooling and heating. But we looked at the issue, what would have happened if it hadn't been um, mechanically ventilated? But one or two other things as well. The building was designed to maximize functionality. Okay, so it was basically there designed primarily to work at the school. 
It was not designed to maximize the potential for thermal mass. So the room sizes, the plan, the orientation were not optimized for that. If they had been, it would probably have been possible to make more use of thermal mass. But the problem with that, if you're going to try and utilize thermal mass in that building, certain things would have had to change. The layout and the orientation of the school would have been different. And therefore, you would have ended up with a different building. And you'd have ended up with a building that would not then have been optimized in terms of its prime functionality. So the building would have been better in terms of environmental issues, but less good in terms of social and economic issues, which obviously is a problem. So a couple of things specifically about the school. The high level of compartmentation of the school meant that it was very difficult to get the cross flow ventilation, which is usually, re usually required to make thermal mass work effectively. Because you've got to get that air in at night and you've got to get it flow, to flow across those, those surfaces. If you can't do that because of high level of compartmentation, it's, compartmentation, it's difficult to make thermal mass work. You can use one side of ventilation on occasion, but there are limiting uh, aspect ratios for the rooms and the dimensions and aspect ratios of the, most of the rooms in that building exceeded those. But most importantly, and this was the real killer in terms of utilizing thermal mass in that building, only 2% of the total energy demand in the building was used for cooling. The huge energy users in that building were heating, lighting, and auxiliary energy. So the point to be made is that here is a building, a lot of buildings, a lot of school buildings have been utilized, have been designed and constructed utilizing thermal mass. And it seems to work on a lot of occasions, but it doesn't work all the time. And therefore, what I'm saying to you is that don't try and force thermal mass. If it's right for a building, and if it works in the building, utilize it. But it won't be right for all buildings. There's another example here, which is, this is um, some results from a study we did, again, in Target Zero. And again, there is a large report on this building uh, in the Target Zero uh, site on steelconstruction.info. But this is based on number one Kingdom Street, a large office block in London. And what we did here was we looked at the building as built. It was built, if you look down at the bottom right and left hand side as you're looking at the screen, um, the, we looked at a building which was basically the as built, which was a composite slab and beam on steel columns. Then we looked at the building if it had been built using concrete flat slab. And then we looked at the building as if it had been built using precast slab on steel beams. What we did was we said, right, let's take that building and assume that we had utilized thermal mass. So effectively, we take the way to suspend the ceiling and exposed the soffits. Now, in practical terms, you probably almost certainly would not do that in a building like this because it's an inner city building. You'd have issues around uh, pollution. You'd have issues around security. But let's suppose you had done it. What we found was that for all three buildings, for all three building forms, for all framing systems. If you had removed the um, suspended ceiling, thermal mass would have worked and would have worked well. The problem was that it, in removing the suspended ceiling, you would have actually then exposed a very large volume, which in its own right would have had to be um, heated and cooled. And the big problem was that the requirements of doing that more than balanced the uh, benefits of using thermal mass. And what you're looking at there, those figures across the top are the building emission rates in kilograms of CO2 per meter squared per year, which is a standard way of reporting carbon emissions in buildings. And there is no difference. So again, that was a building where even if you'd wanted to use thermal mass because of the particular situations in there, you could not have used it. Well, you could have used it, but it would not have brought you any value. So do be aware of that. Thermal mass is not a panacea. Where it works, it works very well, but it's not the solution for everything. So some conclusions. Thermal mass can work to reduce the energy burdens of cooling in some buildings. Yes, it can do that. And we're going to see some examples in, in just a few minutes. We've already seen Wessex Water. Steel and concrete frames and flooring systems have more or less the th same thermal mass potential. That's been accepted. Thermal mass will not work in many buildings. Don't try and force it in. It's not right for every building. Make sure it is right for the building that you're designing. Something I haven't particularly mentioned, but I will mention, is that this issue of preparation of an aesthetic soffit, um, it requires careful consideration, especially if the soffit is concrete. 
An aesthetically pleasing finish requires that more care is required in forming and shaping the surface. This is particularly, tr particularly true of in situ um, floors. Formwork must be new and complete sections between designated construction joints must be capable of being concreted in a single operation. Also, formwork must be adequately supported to prevent differential movement. High standards of dimensional tolerance in casting the slabs are required and aesthetic surfaces must be protected after preparation to retain the specific surface finish. So I'm just pointing out to you that where you have a concrete floor slab, where it's, it's not metal deck, but it's concrete, especially where it's in situ, the aesthetic soffit does require quite a lot of attention. Right, we'll move on to a couple of case studies where um, Tamil mass is used and it was right and it's used and it works very well. I'll start with um, a very special building, one that gets a lot of attention, um, the cooperative headquarters in Manchester. Um, we'll park for a moment the issue of the, any difficulties the cooperative may be having in its own right, but this is a beautiful building. It's a 16-story deep plan building, Briam outstanding, 32,000 square meters of open plan floor area. It's triangular in plan and is centered around a soaring atrium, which extends from the ground floor to roof level. And that large atrium, it's a beautiful atrium, allows natural daylight to penetrate the floor plate and an exposed soffit maximizes the thermal mass. Just for those of you who are interested in these sort of things, um, a natural ventilation system draws fresh air into the building through three large earth tubes and they act as e e earth to heat air. They act as earth to air heat exchangers. 16.5 millimeter long, Fabricated steel beams provide large, column-free, flexible floor plates. The beams support uh, exposed precast concrete coffers, bespoke ones, that are notched to sit on the bottom flanges of the beams. And where have we seen that before? We've seen it at Wessex, Wa Wessex Water. So what goes around comes around. The concrete soffits have been left exposed, maximizing the thermal mass, and a night cooling strategy reduces supplementary cooling alongside both annual and peak demand. So um, an, an example of a large um, building, uh, exemplar building, which utilizes thermal mass. At perhaps the other end of this scale, um, I'm going to talk about a building at St. John's Square and see him. This is a four-story office building, uh, which houses a public library and offices for Durham County Council. See him as a small town in Durham. Natural ventilation to the building is achieved via a series of stacks which penetrate the metal decking and floor slabs culminating at roof levels in louvered boxes. At each level, the number of stacks increases with a total of 15 spread throughout the structure. On the top floor of the building, roof lights also aid the ventilation. So you can see there, you can see the building. This is a composite metal deck building. And you can see there the natural ventilation, the stacks. And one other thing to say about this is that when you remove a suspended ceiling, you can on occasion have an impact on acoustic performance in the building. That was a particular issue in this building. So in part of the building, acoustic suspended ceiling panels were installed to improve the acoustic environment. So that's a consideration as well, something you also have to take into consideration sometimes. Something slightly bigger um, is at the Woolwich Civic Centre. Um, and uh, again, a very pleasant building. Um, this six-story steel-framed office building has strong green credentials. It uses a combination of renewable energy, mixed mode ventilation, extensive use of thermal mass, and a sophisticated building management system. And using these, it's been possible to reduce carbon emissions by about 50% compared to the national standards for offices operating at the time of construction. The building's mixed mode ventilation strategy utilizes the external facade, glazed facade, to naturally ventilate the building where necessary, extra convection cooling is provided by passive chilled beams. And you can see them there. Um, so the uh, so extra convection cooling is provided by passive chilled beams that hang inside the curve of each vault. Whilst the displacement ventilation system on each floor provides space, heating, and comfort cooling. The, this building, by the way, is a Briam excellent building. I should have said as well that the, I think, I don't think I said it, the, um, corporate headquarters I mentioned before was a Briam outstanding building. And here's a case study which I've um, introduced for a very special reason, and that will become obvious as I talk through it. It's the Shires House in Guiseley, and this building is owned by the engineering consultancy Wa um, Watson Batty. 
Steel frame supporting composite metal deck again. Uh, the upper floor soffits are exposed. And you can see there what it looks like internally. Now, the really interesting thing there, the thing that may grab your attention, is that the it's heated and cooled by a ground, uh, using a ground source heat pump, which is coupled to a network of pipes embedded in the concrete in the floor and the upper floor slabs. This is an interesting technology. It's very common on the continent. It's been developed mainly by a company called Upinor, and I've been over to the continent to see this in, in operation, and it's very, very impressive. Yet, it hasn't really taken off in this country, um, and I'm surprised by that. I am a little surprised by that, because it's not as though anybody using it is, has to take the risk of using an unproven technology. This is proven technology, which has hundreds, indeed thousands of uses across the continent. Uh, very, very widely utilized. Um, if you want to actually look at it, I'm going to talk about it for just a little period of time. Um, the, uh, um, I'm just going to show some images of, of what it looks like when it actually arrives on site. These are just some in images. This is the pipes arriving on site in a situation where you are using water cooling, enhanced water cooling. In this instance, they're installed with the mesh. So the actual pipes are installed with the mesh. These are the pipes in place. Now, if you look closely at this, and I'll just hold this picture for just a moment. If you look closely, you might just see that the pipes are tied to the mesh. It's not immediately off obvious, but you can just see it there in a couple of places, the tying in of the pipes onto the mesh. You don't have to install the pipes in that way. Um, this shows pipes in a composite metal deck floor. Now, you need to look carefully. There's two pipes in each trough. The pipes are the same color as the metal decking, so they're not immediately obvious. But you can just see them there. And in this case, they're both supported by, they're all supported by small metal props. So you can do it in, different, in, in other ways as well. This is a long span composite floor system with embedded pipes. And this is in uh, something called the Bobst building in Switzerland, B-O-B-S-T building in Switzerland. If uh, you want to go on the internet, I think you'll be able to find out a bit more about it if you wish to follow this up. And this is embedded water pipes um, at the Luxembourg Chamber of, of Commerce. As I said, it's a surprise to me that there has not been more uptake of this particular technology in the United Kingdom. We've done theoretical studies on it, and what we've been able to demonstrate is you will get multiples of the enhancement of the thermal capacity that you will get just by just using inert floor slabs. Um, typically, certainly in terms of theoretical studies, the enhancement is around about the order of three times. So at least in theory, you will get um, a thermal capacity enhancement of about three times what you will get using these systems compared to what you will get using just the inert concrete floor. Right, just moving back, I just want to mention, go back to this issue that I mentioned before of the attractive floor finish. Um, you can get metal decks. You see, you saw one or two slides of what metal deck flooring systems look like when they're utilized with thermal capacity. You can get plastisol coated deck. Now, this is not something which, to my, my knowledge, has actually been used yet, but you can actually get it, uh, a plastisol coated deck. Now, this will give you a very attractive surface finish. The difficulty with it is, is that you can't fire a shear strud, strud, stud through that metal deck if you try and do it, it won't attach to the beam. Um, so therefore, if you're going to use this, you really have one of two choices. First choice is you either make your floor slab non-composite. That's not very commonly used, but it is used occasionally. I have seen it a couple of times. Or alternatively, if you're going to use it, you could preform the holes in the metal deck. And that's something I've perhaps seen more commonly on a number of occasions. So you can actually get an attractive surface finish using metal deck in that way. I do get asked the question quite regularly with regard to thermal mass, is it possible to actually maintain the suspended ceiling or keep a suspended ceiling and still get thermal mass? It is, in theory at least. It is possible to get thermal mass by using a permeable suspended ceiling that both allows movement of air up to the slab and also hides the soffit from view. And you can see an example here. 
The Steel Construction Institute has worked with the Oxford Institute for Sustainable Development to examine the thermal effects of different types and layouts of perforated suspended ceiling tiles. Test results have shown that perforated metal ceilings can still allow significant heat transfer to and from the soffit. They were found to increase the radiative effect, which compensates for the loss in convective heat transfer resulting from perforations or from the perforations floor resistance. So effectively, the perforations, yes, they do restrict the um, floor resistance, but you do get a radiative, radiative effect from the metal um, ceiling panel, ceiling tiles onto the uh, bottom of the soffit, and that provides quite a lot of compensation. An open area of 20% is about the maximum that can be used if a perforated ceiling is to hide the soffit. This allows approximately 40% of the convective heat transfer that would occur with an exposed slab. However, the thin metal tiles in the ceiling absorb and re-radiate heat, as I've said, from the air into the slab. Under test conditions, over 85% of the cooling effect of an exposed soffit can be obtained with a thin perforated steel ceiling at the same time as hiding the ceiling void. Now, I should stress very strongly that this is theoretical study. I don't think that this has actually ever been used in practice, um, but, uh, the, but at least in theory, something like that will work and work very well. So at least in theory, you can use, you can still use a suspended ceiling and get thermal mass, but you have to be very specific about the type of suspended ceiling that you use. Okay, just a couple of more points. I'm going to go through um, the summary. I'm going to go through claims and facts. And I'm going to tr go through five different issues in terms of claims. And I'm going to try and then talk about each of those and sort of either say, yeah, they're true or no, they're not correct, or maybe qualify whatever the claims are. The first one is what we've seen already. Only 75 to 100 millimeters of concrete is required to provide optimal thermal mass in the building. This is correct. On a 24-hour heating and cooling cycle, only 75 to 100 millimeters of concrete can be mobilized to provide thermal mass. As I said previously, this has been accepted by the concrete center and the steel construction sector, and the BRE have it in BRE Digest, um, the BRE Digest in minute 454 part one. So it's been accepted by all of them. Almost all floors, whether supported by steel or concrete frames, will provide this much concrete. So you don't need the heavy monolithic structures. I know I've said that several times, but it's worth repeating. Used effectively, thermal mass will facilitate the use of naturally ventilated solutions for modern buildings. For many situations, this is correct. However, just as a qualifier on that, predicted changes to future weather patterns would increasingly, would increasingly warm summers mean that a building which will provide a naturally ventilated solution now may not do so in the future. So just be aware of that. If you are somebody who subscribes to the um, theory of man-made global warming and accepts that uh, we are in, in a period of, um, of, of, of increased temperatures um, and that we will get longer, hotter summers, then you need to kind of build that into your calculations. And perhaps if you think that thermal mass won't work very well in the future, um, perhaps build in some backup or support for your thermal mass system as well. Thermal mass has the potential to significantly reduce energy requirements in all buildings. This is not always correct. Some buildings have relatively low cooling loads. And in this case, trying to utilize thermal mass will offer little value. Layout and geometry of other buildings will also reduce the benefits of thermal mass. For example, heavily compartment build, compartmented buildings will limit airflow and restrict the effectiveness of nighttime purging of the exposed slab. An audit of energy use in buildings is all, always advisable if one is considering utilizing thermal mass. Trying to force thermal mass into a building is also an approach which is not advisable. It is very possible that this may have a negative impact on functionality. The thermal mass might work, but the compromises necessary to implement it may have such a negative effect on the building as to make it uneconomic. So again, just be careful of that. Thermal mass is free. Thermal mass is free in the sense that it is there to be used in almost all buildings. However, 
If thermal mass is to be mobilized, it can lead to significant additional costs in terms of ensuring a clean aesthetic finish to the exposed surfaces. In certain situations, especially where you, you're using in-situ concrete, surface preparation can take considerable additional care, and this can odd add to construction costs and time. So just be aware of that. And finally, this is something which I haven't particularly mentioned before. So this is the first time I've brought it up. There's a claim made very often that structurally massive buildings can mobilize greater levels of thermal mass than lightweight buildings during a prolonged warm period. This is a claim that is often made, but has never, to my knowledge, been proven. It is correct to say that thick floor slabs, such as one might find in a post-tension slab, for example, will soak up more heat than a thin composite metal deck floor if a prolonged period of warm weather restricts nighttime purging. However, the other side of it is that this may have two negative effects. First, it has the potential to create a giant thermal flywheel within the building, which will increase the radiant temperatures. Secondly, the thicker slab will take longer to cool when the weather eventually breaks, thus prolonging the effects of the warm period. And that's it. Thank you very much for listening.